you could easily say that the people of Jesus's time, the Pharisees in particular, you could identify a group. They might have said that doesn't feel Judaic enough. Yeah. What he's doing just doesn't, it doesn't ascribe to what I feel like. He's eating on the, he's eating or he's saving somebody on the Sabbath. Like how dare he? Mm -hmm. Right. But what you've done then is you've, you could have all the best intentions in the world, but those intentions could still run askew because now you've placed limits on who God is Mm -hmm. and you've left no room to be surprised by God or taken deeper into the mystery that is God and, and, and Jesus. Mm. And so we do that today. Like when we say it doesn't feel Catholic enough, tell me what that means. Cause feelings have validity. Yes. But what does that actually mean? And so <clears throat> usually it's like we have a perspective on the church and how church should be. And that trumps who Jesus is and who he wants to be to us. And that's a problem. Welcome to the Huntley Leadership Podcast, helping leaders be a positive catalyst to the people they support, the organizations they serve, and the communities they live. This podcast will make you think, laugh, and grit your teeth with new determination to make your parish or business a place of transformation, passion, and purpose. If you're still breathing, you are powered for impact. Hi, welcome to the Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Huntley. Thanks for joining us as we dive into issues of leadership, uh, issues of culture. Today, we're going to talk about evangelization. It's an important topic, and we can tackle it from all kinds of different angles. My guest today is Khalil Hattar from St. John the Evangelist Parish. Welcome to the show, Khalil. Thanks for having me back, Ron. <laughs> if you're watching on, on YouTube, please hit the thumbs up and, and subscribe. That would be helpful. Share the podcast as we break into it. You know, you're one of those people in my life when when we have a topic or just have time to kill and we get talking about issues, I think to myself, where's the camera? <laughs> We're missing all kinds of gold here because we just have so much fun. And, yeah. and so today I want to get the conversation started around issues of evangelization, mm-hmm. things that kind of get our goat. You have a prophetic bent in terms of your APES profile, so speaking into issues of of truth are, are fun for you. It gets you going. And I love when you get going because it gets me going. So <laughs> yeah, I loved how just moments before starting this podcast, you were like, Cool, shut up. <laughs> Stop talking. Stop talking. We're going to say our- <laughs> you're, you're ruining all the good stuff. <laughs> Those magic moments are escaping us. I <laughs> yeah, love it. Love it. So um, cool. We were talking about, and I think this is cool because I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I, I'm sure I should say I haven't seen the third season yet. Maybe they're even in the fourth season, but The Chosen, you were talking the about chosen, The Chosen. Yeah. So, so, and we're, and you said something, I'm thinking, no, people aren't saying that. Yeah, yeah. So to give us some perspective. So The Chosen, the great thing about it, it's reached such a wide what audience. What is it for starters? Because some people aren't going to know. Great. Yeah, great jump off point. So The Chosen, and please fill in uh, any gaps. It is, it's produced by Angel Studios, but what it is uh, is a production of the life. It's a retelling of the life of Jesus Christ. Okay. And typically what you get in the life of Jesus is maybe a, an hour and a half, two hour movie. Mm-hmm. and not a lot of time to fill. Um, with The Chosen, you're getting a multi-season uh, look and uh, you're almost journeying with the disciples as they walked with Christ mm-hmm. during his uh, his period of ministry. Okay. And so it's a lot of, you know, we're not just jumping to the passion. We're not just doing flashbacks into ministry. We're actually walking with him okay. over seasons. And so... It's, I mean, the production value is excellent. The the actors are all top notch. Kind of like us. Kind of, I mean, more like you than me, <laughs> but yeah. Um, they, it's just very well done. Right. And so, what's what's getting me going recently? And people who I love. Yes. Truly, they, and people who I don't even know, just comment commenting online and and you know seeing videos and reviews and sure you know, doing what you shouldn't do. And that's reading the comments on YouTube and Twitter. You do that. Uh, You know, I might take a peek every once in a while. (laughs) People don't, I mean, they're objecting to the chosen, especially when in the Catholic circle, Mm -hmm. because it's not Catholic enough or it deviates from the literal expressions that are found in the gospels Gotcha. or what's preserved in sacred tradition. Okay. And that gets me going for a number of reasons. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
not everything in the chosen is accurate to scripture and tradition, hundred percent. But those things, so far, they're in their third season. They tend to be minor details that don't impact the overall message that that Jesus came sure. to to proclaim. Gotcha. They don't really diminish his identity, right? Um, and so we should a be celebrating the fact that there's a production of this caliber right. with a cast of this caliber mm-hmm. that's able to to speak across audiences and not just be restricted to one group or demographic, mm-hmm. have appeal and draw people into the story of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I think that's a win for the the kingdom. It's a win for Christ if we're able to do that. Right. Let's celebrate those moments. Let's have more of those moments. Mm-hmm. Let's empower the people that want to make those moments available. Right. So that's my first thing. It's like, hey, let's stop bickering yes. and let's start celebrating, right? Okay. The, the second thing is not everything has to be perfect and that's okay, right? There's four gospels for a reason. Jesus was such a multifaceted person. You're a multifaceted, I'm a multifaceted person. No one story is going to capture perfectly the person of Christ. Right. And so you have three synoptic gospels. You've got the gospel of John. All of them have slight variations. John, I mean, he's on, mm-hmm. he, he's completely where John is. Um, but still, you know, uh, there's a lot of tie over crossover into the synoptics. And so what you're getting with the chosen is almost like a fifth gospel that's inspired by the original gospels that we have preserved in the New Testament canon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Why? Because it's doing what the church wants us to do with the practice of Lectio Divina. For those who don't know, Lectio Divina is praying with scripture, Mm -hmm. actually placing yourself in scripture, immersing yourself in scripture. Using your imagination. Using your imagination to say, what's the weather like? Right. What does it feel like? What am I feeling being this beggar on the side of the road? as a commotion starts stirring up and I don't know why it's stirring up, but this Jesus guy is coming down and he's got some people with him and he's walking by me. What's running through my mind as a, as a, yeah, as a beggar, Mm -hmm. as a, as somebody who can't walk and yeah. And placing yourself in a prayerful way in the scriptures, filling out the details that aren't there so that the Holy spirit can speak to you through the scripture. Right. Yeah. So in essence, that's what Lexio Divina is. In essence, that's how the chosen should be interpreted. Hmm. We're placing ourselves through this one lens, right? Through this yes. one image of this series in the scriptures in a new way. Hmm. And we're saying, wow, th- this is what it could have been like to have been Matthew accompanying Jesus. This is what it could have been like to have been the friend of the person, the paralytic that was on the roof, they tore through the roof to bring Jesus down. That's what it could have been like. Lord, what, what does it take for, for me to have the, the, the roof of my heart torn open so mm-hmm. that you can come in, mm-hmm. right? And so I just think there's so much fruit to be had through tools like these. And that's yeah. what it is. The chosen could be a tool, a springboard to a deeper conversation. Yes. And if you see something bad, like, you know, um, I heard, I like breaking the habit. I don't know if, if you, you're familiar with them. No. He's a, um, I believe he's, I don't want to get this wrong, Franciscan, might be Carmelite. I think he's Franciscan, young priest, um, YouTube channel. He's got an Instagram following, all that, okay. all that good stuff. So check him out, breaking the habit. Um, but he and another priest review it and the chosen. The chosen yeah. Okay. Yeah. The chosen. And uh, they like it. But one of the things the, the the priest had said that was reviewing with him, he didn't like the fact that Matthew uh, was scribbling things down as if he were keeping a live record of what Jesus was doing while Jesus was doing it. Okay. The argument being that most likely Matthew was inspired later on because the Gospels came and were written later on. Okay. That's my point exactly. Such a minor detail. Yeah. Let's not get hung up on that because yeah. it has nothing to do with the message and person of Jesus and the impact he could have on us. But also, how do you know he didn't scribble anything down? Right. So let's start Just a conversation. It's not there doesn't mean it didn't happen. Exactly. Right. And what a springboard to a great conversation we can have. Right. And now we're talking about Christ. Now we're talking about the gospel. Now we're talking about things that, you know, actually can have an impact and substance and 
can put our lives on a trajectory that, that it wasn't on before. Yeah. And so if you could do that with other people, friends, family, get them watching The Chosen and then start having conversations with them. This is what Jesus was actually saying, or wasn't it great when Jesus did that? Oh my God, what an, what an amazing tool for evangelization. <laughs> let, me, let me go back to something you said earlier, because it always confounds me when people say it's not Catholic enough. What is Catholic enough? Like, what does that even mean? Mm. That's a great question, because Catholic in its essence, right? Lowercase Catholic means universal. Okay. So it's almost like anything could be Catholic. <laughs> I'm sure I just like ruffled some yeah, there, You just right? blew that topic. Yeah, I'm very sure. <laughs> now <laughs> where, do we, yeah, where do you even go it's now? Be the first time I ever get comments. <laughs> yeah. So let's work that back. Okay. So if Catholic means universal, and again, we're, the, I think the level of conversation could happen at multiple levels. Okay. So at a very conversational introductory level without getting very technical and theological is God and the things of God are that which are good, true, and beautiful. Okay. Anything that is objectively good, true, and beautiful is by nature objective, is by nature universal, and therefore it goes is by nature Catholic. Okay. That which is good, true, and beautiful points to God and therefore it's shared among us. It is universal. It is lowercase c Catholic. Yes. So something like the chosen, or it could be something else. When it's good, true, beautiful, when it points us to God, when it sets us up on a trajectory towards God, by nature, Catholic. Okay. When we start getting in a uppercase Catholic C, right? When you think Catholic Church. Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic. Now we're talking about a Catholic that is defined by a richness that extends beyond our subjective here and now, okay. our experience. It's defined by 2,000 years of tradition. Mm -hmm. It's defined by church proclamation. It's defined by apostolic tradition. It's defined by all these things that we've inherited, mm -hmm. some of which have been divine reve divine re divinely revealed, okay. some of which we've worked out as a community of believers, which we hold to be true and which we want to pass on to others. That's kind of like uppercase Catholic. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when people say it's not Catholic enough, I'm guessing they're not talking small C, they're talking large C. Yeah. And, and so when they're talking large C, is it their preferences, do you think? Or is like when it's, it's not Catholic enough, it's... Or, you know, I've heard I've heard something else. Somebody say people say too. Something doesn't feel Catholic. And I, I think, wow, I didn't know Catholic was a feeling. Like that's kind of cool. Like, but it 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 basically says to me, and I'm not saying that this is right or not, but I, I want to talk about it. Is that it's it's outside of my comfort zone. I see myself as a Catholic, therefore, that must not be Catholic enough. Like, what what could they possibly be getting at? Because I hear that about Alpha. Oh, it's not Catholic. Well, yeah. no kidding. But Jesus wasn't Catholic either. That didn't seem to bother us. And so, like, I just, I find it funny when, if it doesn't come out of the Roman Catholic tradition, then it's automatically something we should be suspicious of and or reject. And I think that's certainly limits our, and Jesus was so funny, irritating the daylights out of the Israelites at different times. And I'm no, I've never not seen any greater faith than this. And it's yeah. a centurion. It's like, wow, you're not allowed to say that. Or what are you doing over there with those, those tax collectors or Samaritans or, you know, or, or, or prostitutes. And, and you should be over here with us religious people. And Jesus is like, man, like I came to, to heal the, the people that are most disenfranchised to be mm -hmm. with them. You're okay. You know, and it, it just seems that there's that pharmaceutical kind of heart mm. out there that still is kind of protecting us for something we don't need protection from. Yeah. That's so interesting that you bring up that analogy because you could easily say that the people of Jesus's time, the Pharisees in particular, you could identify a group. They might have said that doesn't feel Judaic enough. Yeah. What he's doing just doesn't it doesn't ascribe to what I feel like. He's eating on the he's eating or he's saving somebody on the Sabbath. Like how dare he? Mm -hmm. Right. But what you've done then is you've, you could have all the best intentions in the world, but those intentions could still run askew because now you've placed limits on 
who God is mm. and you've left no room to be surprised by God or taken deeper into the mystery that is God and, and, and Jesus. Mm. And so we do that today. Like when we say it doesn't feel Catholic enough, tell me what that means. Cause feelings have validity. Yes. But what does that actually mean? And so <clears throat> usually it's like, we have a perspective on the church and how church should be. And that trumps who Jesus is and who he wants to be to us. And that's a problem. I mean, we can refer to clericalism as something that mm -hmm. readily relates to priests and bishops, but it can go far beyond that. Yeah. Lay people, I mean, regular people who ascribe, who say they're Catholic can also foster this culture of clericalism mm -hmm. that I think goes against the spirit of the gospels and what Jesus wants for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's when we start getting entrenched into tribes within the community mm -hmm. rather than celebrating our identity as members of the community. Mm. Jesus seemed to be so confident in whose he was, who he was, and what his call was, that he could be in any scenario, any situation with any group of people, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not they were the in crowd or people that you were clean or unclean or all these things that we use to differentiate and bring division. He walked right through all those divides with so much comfort, so much love, so much compassion, so much self-confidence and self-assurance that's who I want to be. Like, I don't want to be limited yeah. by, oh, you know, father so-and-so or, or layperson so-and-so who's a really popular Catholic said, this is who I have to be if I'm Catholic. Thinking to myself, well, you know, Mary went, <laughs> she did some things. She said yes to something that was far outside of the comfort zone and the norms of her time, put her life at risk to say yes, to give birth to the Son of God. Uh, as an unmarried, unwed woman who was a virgin, 14 years old, like, come on. Mm -hmm. Like, her courage to to go beyond what was normal, what was expected, what the regulations and expectations were of a Jew at the time. And I think a lot of our biblical heroes were willing to do what God was calling them to do, discern for themselves within the context of that intimate relationship, and have the courage to go beyond. Mm -hmm. And, boy, I, I always find it uncomfortable when people put those lines in the ground so strongly and almost dare you to go over them or you're not like them. You're not Catholic enough. Mm. Oof, it just never makes me feel particularly good. I am Catholic, born and raised. Yeah. <laughs> I choose to be Catholic. I love our Roman Catholic faith, um, both small C and large C. Yeah. And I lay my life down for it. And yet it's not my primary identity is in Jesus. And I am laying my life down for the Roman Catholic Church because I love it. And yet I'm, I can learn from all kinds of people, mm -hmm. all kinds of scenarios. And I'm always uncomfortable when people from my tribe or that tribe, you know, kind of warns us against watching The Chosen or, yeah. or I don't know, you bring know, up an interesting point. What's, what's interesting... Um, Yeah, there's so much in that that we could unpack. What's interesting to me, at least uh, readily, um, the culture is so can be so scary, and the culture can be so toxic mm -hmm. that what is easy for us to do and fall into is this idea of we need to protect the tradition and the church mm -hmm. and from falling into the gray areas, mm -hmm. which will eventually lead us down the slippery slope, slippery right? slope yeah. of losing the pearl of great price that was entrusted to us. Gotcha. And so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of good people that really love the traditions and the rituals and the expressions and the life of the church that's been developed, been preserved, been passed on, and they want to see that extend out into the future. Beautiful. And that that is beautiful. That's very beautiful. I love the traditions of Me the too. church. I was raised, my mother's uh, Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox, my dad's Latin Catholic. 
Uh, my wife's Maronite Catholic. Right. Like the, I've just, I've been raised into the richness of the church and all of her expressions, mm. East and West. So I can see that there is goodness in wanting to preserve that. Amen. And we should. Problem is when we start drawing those lines in the sand mm -hmm. where you can't transgress, you know, this is how church should be. This is how you should approach church. You need to behave a certain way, mm -hmm. act a certain way, believe a certain thing before you belong to us. Mm -hmm. And things in the culture and the arts, and if they don't conform, if they don't behave and believe, and then they don't belong. And so right. we need to cut them off. Mm -hmm. When, to your point, what Jesus did is he engaged and he went into those scenarios that didn't believe and behave and act the way that the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted mm -hmm. in a way that scandalized them and shocked them. But he did that in order to bring his light into those situations. Mm -hmm. He's so confident in who he is that he's able to enter into that, mm -hmm. not just bring the light, be the light in his instance, baptize that situation so much so that those people that find themselves in those situations mm -hmm. are drawn out of the culture and the life that they're living. Amen. And they begin to see life anew through him. Mm -hmm. Right. We were talking at, at our meeting yesterday and I just had the thought like the life that Christ calls us to and the truth that he has in store for us does not make sense. Period. Right. Full stop. That's something I picked up from you. <laughs> period. Full stop. That life and that truth does not make sense, whether it's on pro-life issues, whether it's on LGBTQ issues, whether it's on uh, marriage. I mean, you could just go down the line of things that people find maybe difficult to believe and live at first, things that the church holds as, as, as sacred to the flourishing of the human person. That life and truth does not make sense until you've encountered the way. Mm. Once you've encountered the way, once you've encountered the person of Jesus, once he's impacted your life so much so that he's taken you off of the path that you're on and placed you on the narrow path and you begin to walk with him, he who is the way shall make the life and the truth that he calls you to a reality. Mm. He'll help you walk it and not just help you walk it. You'll desire it. Mm. You'll want to grow deeper into it. And so when we talk about evangelization and we kind of, you know, I was, I started drinking a Zoa at the start of this thing. So Ron had me off. I was all jacked up before we even started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't judge me. <laughs> Which, hey, I'm going to plug a rock. If you want to sponsor the Ron Huntley Leadership Podcast, please do. Zoa is a great drink. And then put some positivity out into the world. I know he's trying to do some positive things. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Rock. Right? Yeah. Thanks, Rock. <laughs> so we started talking about the chosen. But in reality, evangelization, pure evangelization seems to be how can I accompany people so that they can encounter the way, so they can encounter Jesus to actually see his face, be transformed by him. Mm. And then we can start talking about the type of life that Jesus calls them to. Mm. So let's not start with a conversation about how to live your life. Let's start right. talking about the fact that God exists, he loves you, and that there's more to life than this. Mm. Yeah. Tie in alpha. Tie in alpha. <laughs> I'm queuing you up. You and alpha. Bring it alpha. <laughs> but really, isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. God exists. He loves you. He wants more for you. And then that's the springboard to a deeper conversation mm -hmm. and relationship. Good point, because, you know, if God doesn't exist, then how does that, what's that mean for your life? Like, how are you going to live your life if God does it? Dog eat dog? <laughs> Survival of the fittest? Like, what are we talking about here? And how is that going to impact the way you live your life? And, you know, sheesh, that's, that's an interesting perspective. And there's people that have it. And God bless them. Like, I know a lot of people that have that. And, and there are some people that have that perspective. God doesn't exist, and therefore they know who I am, and they want to stay as far away as possible yeah. of any conversations of faith, which I understand. But I also know some people who don't believe what I believe, or that there is a God, but then also are very comfortable and confident in who they are. And they have a 
and they're willing to enter into conversations. And those are really fun conversations when yeah. we don't have the same starting point, but we can share ideas and perspectives and really be curious and listen to understand. I always find those conversations very fun and engaging. And I always appreciate the courage it takes for somebody with a different worldview to talk. You have to have that conversation with somebody. You can't have it with anybody. No. It has to be with somebody who at least is coming to the table with an open heart and an open mind. You know, we mentioned earlier, we can get so entrenched into our tribe that it and, begins to... And the language that goes with it. The language, the ideas, um, that, that sh kind of puts blinders on our worldview and our perspective. Mm -hmm. And so what you need really, and this is kind of... This is most of the the struggle, at least I find in my, in in my lived experience, it's helping somebody soften their heart so much so, so that deeper, more impactful conversation can happen and could have the potential to bear fruit. Mm. But when somebody comes to the conversation just like entrenched in what they believe, mm -hmm. and their identity dictates their ideas dictate their identity, and they they can't separate the two, it's like. I believe this and I am this. And it's like, yeah, man, it's really hard to make any progress. I was at, uh, actually, I'm going to be going to the Alpha Conference in the UK this in 2020, May 2023. Oh, cool. Yeah, it'd be fun. And years ago, I went, and Simon Sinek was one of the keynote speakers, and somebody from the audience um, yelled out, because it was a QA, and a so it was appropriate to yell out. <laughs> but what he yelled out, I wasn't overly comfortable with. He says, what's preventing you from giving your life to Jesus Christ right now? And first of all, bold. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm in Seneca in front of thousands of yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, but I, I personally find that quite disrespectful in many ways because you've literally done nothing to invest in him. You might feel like you are because you're on the receiving end of him talking. And so you're listening to him and maybe you follow some of his stuff. And so you make these judgments. But his, his answer back to him. I thought was really cool because he said something like, and I'm going to forget it. <laughs> I watched the video probably, oh, geez, that wasn't what he said at all. But my, my remember, memory of that is that he said something like, what makes you think I don't? Like, what is it that makes you think you're different than me? Like, why is that your starting point? Mm -hmm. Like, why is that how we're going to start this conversation? Yeah. It's like basically you're saying, I'm not like you and you want me to be like you. So do that right now. Wow. And I just thought, yeah, how disrespectful. <laughs> like, how, how disrespectful. Intent was probably good. <laughs> yeah. But how disrespectful. What a terrible starting point. is Because oftentimes we have so much more in common. And so if we really want to get to know the person, have some really wonderful conversations about what makes them happy, what they strive for, that's a really fun conversation. Yeah. And where that goes, well, trust God. Like, trust the Holy Spirit in that. Like, give that person his due. You know, that's such a... That's such a rich example. You tie that back to the Gospels. So you've got four Gospels that try to preserve for all of, of history who the person of Jesus Christ is, right? Mm -hmm. He's revealed through the saints and through the tradition of the church. And But these four Gospels are really the bread and butter of it all. And they're each a little different in their own way. At the end of John's Gospel, he says, all the books in the world couldn't right. contain the stories and the accounts of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So there's obviously a richness that we haven't tapped into yet. Yeah. And I think that's what's being revealed to us through the church and the saints. Yes. We're kind of getting it filtered through them. We won't know until we actually, God willing, see him face to face. Um, but so what's preserved in those gospels is of invaluable importance to us. Mm. And one of the things that touches on that example mm -hmm. is the model that Jesus demonstrates for us on how to engage other people. Mm -hmm. And he never starts with a questioning. He never throws out, why don't you believe? He never is never accusatory unless he's rebuking something or someone. Yeah. And it's, they're usually religious people, by the way. They're usually the <laughs> like religiously us. entrenched. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're usually like us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's usually rebuking us. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, God, I got a great story about that. But we're going to stick on point here. We'll circle back to that story. Okay. Uh, the model that Jesus gives us is, hey, Zechariah, climb down out of that tree. I'm having dinner at your place. 
right? Right. That's the model. It's like, and what a terrible me, I idea. Get We're to not supposed you. to talk to that guy. Yeah. He, he's a tax collector. You just don't go near those guys. They're rotten to the core. Yeah. Like they're not like us. They're, they're, they're abusing us. They're working for the other side. Mm-hmm. Like they're traitors. They're horrible people. Do not spend time with guys like that. That's what he does. And that's what he does. But he, he goes to them and he extends an invitation. I want to get to know you. Right. Right. I want to invest in you. And then once that relationship's been developed, we can start, we, it, can, it can go where God wants it to go. Amen. It can be baptized, so to speak, and, and hopefully place somebody into an encounter of Jesus that then leads them to know the truth of the life and the person and then et cetera. Mm. But it's got to start with that initial investment, that initial invitation. And that's what we tend to get wrong. And I think that's why we're losing the culture wars. I think that's why even in Pope Benedict's words, the church is going to get a lot smaller, but stronger before it gets bigger again. Cardinal George used to say the same thing. We have to recapture the power of that invitation. Mm. So when it says, when you say get smaller, sometimes people see that. I've heard that it's going to get smaller because yeah. God needs more people like me who are zealots and not going to, you know, going to hold up the truth and, and, to hell with everybody else, and we don't need them anyway. And and it's almost this, it's almost... It can be, right? Yeah, yeah it can yeah, be yeah. a real excuse for ditching people left, right, and center, the, the complete opposite of what I see in the Gospels, like the total opposite. And so when it gets smaller, in what sense? Like, what kind of heart is God looking for to bring the, his love, his the revolution of love and healing and stuff and, and purpose and meaning into people's lives? Like... You know, I, I wonder, you know, because again, zealots see that as the, the reason to, yes, <laughs> like there can be a far right perspective of damning everybody else. And I'm thinking, I, yeah. And that's really awkward and uncomfortable because I'm pretty sure that's the exact attitude Jesus was rebuking. Mm-hmm. The exact attitude that Jesus was rebuking. He even rebuked his own. Apostles, <laughs> multiple times. Peter, probably the hardest. Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's Luke. This is where I reveal my Catholic background. I'm like, I'm struggling to come up with the verse. I think it's Luke 949. Okay. Uh, Luke 949. I'm going to go with it. Okay. It's the story. I think it's John comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, Lord, we saw others driving demons out in your name, we stopped and them. we stopped them because they were not one of us. Yeah. And it's like, you Jesus. sit back. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Jesus, like I can just imagine. You, the face palm must have been just epic. Right? Right? I couldn't agree more. And it's like, uh, time out. <laughs> what, what did you just do? Like, because he wasn't a part of U12 that I picked out, He's out there driving out demons. Helping people. Helping people. You're seeing people walking away free. You're seeing demons cast out. You're seeing literal miracles happen before you. I mean, if I saw somebody cast out a demon, I don't I don't know what I would do, Ron. I couldn't probably say on this podcast or Mike's gonna have to bleep it. Like if I saw an <laughs> right? actual demon cast out. Yeah. But it just goes to show you this entrenchment, even with the best intentions that we have. Yes. Because they weren't a part of this group and shared this perspective and had, you know, this exact teaching, this exact thing, we have to stop them. What does Jesus say? He rebukes John and he says, anyone who is for me cannot be against me. Mm. Anyone who is for me cannot be against me. Just the wisdom in that simple rebuke Mm -hmm. that if you see something that is good, true and beautiful, that objectively points to God that can bring somebody into an encounter and experience of God Mm -hmm. that can hopefully ultimately lead you as the person who knows Jesus Mm -hmm. to accompany somebody else so that they can see Jesus in you so that they can have an impression and encounter of Jesus themselves. That's taking place. Praise and glory to God. Amen. Because that's a win for the kingdom. Amen. And then you start leading them into the Catholic life. Mm -hmm. You start leading them into the truths that are preserved Right. In the Catholic tradition. Yeah. It does not have to start the other way around. Yes. That's beautiful. And, and what's the lesson in that for me? Because that's not, 
I, 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 I'm often guilty of reading scripture and saying, yeah, give it to them, Jesus. Yeah, they deserve it. I feel like I almost see myself behind Jesus, like clapping and pointing the finger yeah. and scowling at those big jerks that, he, that he's talking to and that I realize he's actually talking to me. Mm-hmm. You know, he's talking to me. And so when is it in my life that I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, like that, that fear drives my pushing the other way or, or defining myself other than versus being curious and listening, even if it's a different perspective, even if it's not Roman Catholic. Like, can I be in a space where I can love and appreciate and respect the handiwork of God and all of these other people, mm. even if they're not? necessarily directly a part of my tribe. I find that's when I'm at my most peace. I find that's when I can be at my most impactful. But when I'm driven by fear and separation and division and pride, boy, I'd, I'm not at my best. You know, we haven't taught people, and this is a failure on our part, but we're starting to identify it. And there's a lot of good work being done, mm-hmm. even just online. Like mm-hmm. you look at Word on Fire is doing excellent work, mm-hmm. meeting people where they are. You don't have to come to church to have Jesus come to you. Amen. Uh, Father Mike Schmidt's doing great work. Dynamic Catholic's doing great work. Mm -hmm. Breaking the habit, mentioned them earlier. They're doing great work. Mm -hmm. To bring Jesus to people in a way that makes him, breaks down the barriers and and makes him presentable to them Mm -hmm. without the baggage of, I need to actually get in my car and go to this one place and that's where I get you. No, they're bringing Jesus to people and that's great. And praise and glory to God for that. The things that we need to do when we speak about evangelization, discipleship begins with us. Mm -hmm. So to teach people how to properly pray, how to discern the spirit, how to see the fruit of the spirit grow, like being implanted and growing in our lives, Mm -hmm. because we each have a different charism and a gift that the spirit wants to give us. Mm -hmm. Those are things that we really need to be able to, hopefully as, as whatever you want to call it, leaders or mature disciples who want to be able to accompany others in that that process of growth, right? We need to be able to, to hand that off to them. So I like someone like a St. Therese uh, of Avila. She talks about self-detachment a lot. Mm-hmm. That's such an important teaching for today. Mm-hmm. Like maybe you need to detach yourself spiritually, um, intellectually from the ideas that you have of how a Christian life should be lived. Hmm. Try that exercise. Right. What are maybe some extra things that you've taken on? A little, maybe some um, uh, practices or rituals that, while good in themselves, maybe keep you from encountering the face of Jesus. Hmm. Uh, what's a better way of saying that? Maybe are you comfortable in this idea of self detachment, abandoning yourself to Jesus? Hmm. Jesus, I abandon myself to you. Holy Spirit, I abandon myself to you and resting in that and seeing how he responds. I love the church. I love the Eucharist. I love confession. I love the sacraments. I love the fact that I can put my family in the car on Sunday, drive to church, say in our Father, three Hail Marys and a glory be. And we're going to call for the intercession of the Sacred Heart. Yeah. The Immaculate Heart. We're going to, we have our patron saints. I love that we do that stuff. But at the same time, what fuels all that is Jesus. I trust in you, Jesus. I abandon myself to you, Jesus. Mm. My heart is open. Come, Holy Spirit, and mm. just sit in that and see where it takes you. Mm. But that's where, all, like, that's where all those other things should also line up. Right. You do that. Do you have like a community that can help you walk through discerning that? Do you have? Mm. What would you say to that? Like, how do you, how do you accompany somebody? Well, you know. I, and this is why I love the work that I do with churches so much is because I really believe that churches should be a place where people go to become great. Like we're, we should be in the greatness business. <laughs> like Jesus didn't come to take away our suffering. He came to make us great. Mm-hmm. And, but, but so often I find that people's experience of, of churches sometimes can be just um, doing certain, certain things or particular behaviors, but it doesn't become as personal as it could. There's a, tool that's used by some churches called the ME25 surveys by the Gallup organization. Uh, They wrote Growing an Engaged Church. Mm. And one of the questions in this 25 question survey, it it really cracks me up because of how people viscerally respond negatively to the question. They hate it. And it is, do you have a best friend in the church? 
Wow. A lot of Catholics hate that. I do not go to church to make friends. I am there because Jesus sacrificed on the cross. He asked me to give up one hour of my week to come and worship him, and I'm willing to do that. I'm not there for me. I'm not there to make friends. This is a, a duty and a responsibility. And I think, I love your passion. I love that zeal. Uh, however, if you're making friends at church, you're probably not going to leave it ever. Uh, mm. And and when you are making authentic friends at church, then what ends up happening is you get to have real conversations. And mass isn't a conversation with others. You know, it's it's a it's the highest form of prayer. It's the source. Of, you know, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. Mm-hmm. But as my friend Father James often says, if you don't do anything the rest of the week, it's the source and summit of nothing. Mm. Right. And so what do you do? And as a church, how do we create spaces where authentic friendships can grow so that we can be honest, real, authentic and have actual conversations? And I would suggest that if that's not happening at your church, then you'll never be able to accompany people in the context of your church because it's not even a goal. Like we just want people to go. (laughs) It's It's what a terrible goal. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> that somebody goes to church. Like, that is such a small target. Like, what a terrible goal. Because any monkey can go to church. Yeah. Like, but 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 what if we could help people be great? Like, really great. What if we could help them uh, get in touch with their true identity so much so that their confidence, their self-esteem grew to the point where everybody around them noticed that they had this level of peace and confidence that they never had before? What if we could do that? And we can. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. But it's not even a goal. And so... You know, how do we accompany people? You know, I, again, I, you know, I, I, I applaud organizations like Focus and CCO yeah. that they, they're really one-on-one personal accompaniment. It's a really important part of, of their ethos. And I love that. And I appreciate that. I, I, and, and I can respect that. My call, the part of the wall that I feel called to build up is mobilizing a church for impact were, you know, so fun talking with Louie even last night as we met with the connect group leaders at yeah. the church. And it was the very first connect group support leadership meeting they had. It was so fun to be there. Like, this is an epic day. It's an epic moment because this is going to be multiplied and the impact and the lives that are going to be transformed through this ministry post-alpha is unbelievable. Yeah. And, and Louis even saying he, he can't believe how many stories of transformed lives that have happened through his ministry here at wow. St. John the Evangelist. And, and, and that gets me even more excited than, than a person helping one person. I, don't get me wrong. I think that's incredibly important. And if that's your call, you darn well better do it. Be faithful to what God is calling you to do. I know for me and my call that God has in my life is helping pastors learn and bishops learn how to lead in ways that there's this multiple kind of effect of of grace, structure, caring, uh, bringing people into these conversations and setting them up so that authentic friendships grow. And it's actually, there's a structure for all that. There's platforms for all those things to happen so that you can't even count the number of stories. Like that's where I, you know, I'm a multiplier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what gets me most excited. So I don't know if that's a direct answer to your question, but well, I'm hearing like the apostolic and the organizational approach mm. to the fact that accompaniment needs to happen. But how do we do that yes. in a way that impacts churches, not just individuals? Yes. Right. You're mobilizing churches, and not the church boils down to the individual. Mm-hmm. And I liked what you said about, you know, what's the point of just bringing somebody to mass? What I'm thinking is how do we help the individual awaken to this idea that the responsibility for creating disciples rests on you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't rest on the church. It doesn't rest on father. You person in the pew who call yourself or who think yourself a disciple, the responsibility of making others is on your shoulders. Mm. And I wonder if, if, but like, how do we get people? Yeah. How do we get people to the point of seeing themselves as disciples? Like that? I know this is. Well, and, and, and this is where church language, I have a good friend of mine named Wayne and I talk about him all the time. <laughs> Sounds like Snuffleupagus. Someday I'll have him on the podcast and everybody will get to meet him. But, you know, he's a businessman and he's a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. And, you know, he says to me, Ron, I don't speak church. And then he says whatever he says. And it's just so cool, the things that come out of his mouth. And it's so easy for me to put church language to the very truths that he's speaking. Sure. 
but he doesn't speak church. And I just think, good, I, I, I got to speak a little less church sometimes. So, you know, a lot of people, did they, in the pews, do they consider themselves disciples? I think a lot of them don't even think about it. It's like not even a question they ask themselves. And so if I were to ask that differently, my question might be, do you care about people? Yeah, I care about people. Okay, cool. How can you help us? Like Zig Ziglar has this line I love. You'll get what, what you want out of life if you'll just help enough other people get what they want out of life. <laughs> He's a motivational speaker I used to listen to years ago when I was in sales. And I just love that line. And and it's very consistent with our faith. And he, he too is a Christian, but is it's not about me. Can you Can I live my life in love and service of others? And just trust that God's going to take care of me. I was like, that's actually a lot of fun. And so when it comes to, you know, how can we help people care? Because, you know, what's it mean to be a disciple? I, I, I don't know. You know, lifelong learner of Jesus, sure. But let's get the church language out of it for a minute. Do you care about people? Yes. If you, if you care about people and you wanted to, to help them as much as possible, what could you do? Like, what's going to help somebody more than anything else? And in some cases, it's, you know, very few Catholics have ever brought anybody to faith. I remember being one of them for most of my life. Mm -hmm. It's painful for me to say I believe what I believe and, and how miraculous it is and how true it is, and then literally bring nobody to faith. It's very painful for me to be that ineffective. And but are we saying, like, uh, you have to be an extrovert who's bringing people to faith? Like, that, I could see that scaring yeah. people away. Well, but, because but that's just not who I am. Right. And so am I, what are you asking me to do now? I care about people. I'm asking you to be faithful. And so okay. who are you? And so, and what do you believe? And, and, and one of the thing is, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes or no? Cause if he didn't, then we don't have to have the rest of the conversation. But if you believe he did, well, that's pretty crazy. And does he make a difference in your life? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And honestly, if he doesn't, that's Okay. You've been coming to church all this time, and and Jesus hasn't. And if He hasn't made a difference in your life, I, to me, I think, and that's on me as a leader in a church. Like I'm sorry that that your experience could be one that you could feel like Jesus doesn't make a difference in your life. Because the truth is, if He's not making a difference in your life, why are you going to tell anybody? And so I think, in one sense, we have to grapple with that. Like, Lord, do you matter to me? Yeah. Like I'm going to church because good people go to church, or at least that's what my grandmother taught me. And so, and then that's what my mother taught me. And so I want to be a good person. And so is that where it ends or is this true? And, and if it's true, does it make a difference? And if it's true and it doesn't make a difference yet, then what do I need to do that it does make a difference? And so figure that out. Have conversations with people who believe it does make a difference and figure that out. And strive for that until it does make a difference. And once it makes a difference, once Jesus makes a difference in your life, then it becomes a lot easier. But if it doesn't, then it's an intellectual exercise. Other people told me Jesus made a difference. I've got this book here that says he did some pretty cool things. So maybe you should think about that. I don't know. I just don't think that's particularly appealing. What a cool working definition for evangelization. It's like, do you care enough about people? Do you believe that God makes a difference? in your life and potentially in others. And what are you going to do to help make that happen? Because then it's way easier because I, and I often work with churches who are not a big fans of evangelization. They just want to do everything but evangelization and hope their church will grow, which I think, good luck. Let me know how that works for you. Yeah. I never see it working. And then it's like, well, let's just educate people enough in theology. Cause if they really have the right teachings, then this place is going to blow up. Never seen that happen, but, Good luck. Let me know if it works. Yeah. Bring people into an encounter. Like, and that's why I love Alpha. It, it, it doesn't make any sense how, how well it works. Does it work for everybody? No. Does it change everybody's life? No. I don't know anything that does. But it's changed more people's lives than anything else I've ever seen. Yeah. And I've seen people. I remember this one lady. Went to church her whole life. It was at the celebration dinner. At the very end of Alpha, people get a chance to invite people to the celebration dinner. And she comes, she comes up to me. Her name is Marlene, I think. Marilyn. Marlene or Marilyn. And she's probably in her 60s. And she said to me, Ron, I did Alpha because you and Father were so excited about it. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll do it. And every week I went, I thought, what am I doing here? I've learned nothing that I didn't know before. This is a complete waste of my time. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, where's this going? <laughs> and she said, until we got to the week on how and why should we tell others? She said, I realize I've been 
in the Catholic Church my entire life, and I've never, ever brought anybody to faith. And it scared the daylights out of me. I knew for a fact that that was the reason I was at Alpha. Yeah. And she said, so I'd like you to come over and meet the 14 people I've brought with me wow. to the celebration dinner. And I just get goosebumps telling you the story. We can get really hung up and caught up on teaching and scripture and all the trappings of faith, which are beautiful, and it not make a difference in bringing a single soul to Christ. And if I'm a leader in the church, and that's the position I put the followers of my church in, that none of them have had a chance to live. James chapter 5, You brave, if you bring one sinner to faith, you'll cover a multitude of sins, right? You'll save them from sure death. Mm -hmm. if, if people haven't experienced that, then as a leader, I haven't done my job. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that's totally off track of whatever you asked me 15 minutes ago. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I like that you were able to tie together. There isn't one rubric. There isn't one thing that you do. There, aren't a, there isn't a list that you check off. This is how evangelization happens. Mm. It really boils down to if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you've sense. given yourself over to the Holy Spirit, if you're living the life that he wants for you mm -hmm. and you care enough about other people to say, there's more to life than this. Come check it out. Come check it out. And I'm going to walk with you. Mm -hmm. I also like that. It's, you don't have to be the extrovert who's just loving on people all the time. And, mm -hmm. Oh, this guy's great. I'm going to talk to this guy and invite this guy. Cause I'm not that guy. No, I can turn it on when I have to, but I'm very introverted. So that, if that's what evangelization is, I suck at it. I mean, I'll be the first one to tell you that's not me. So find, and again, the body has many parts. Find the role, be the part that God needs you to be. Amen. Be faithful to that. And be faithful to that. And he'll use you. He will use you, and that is sharing the good news. That is evangelization. That is bringing glory to his name and, you'll see and building up his church. And you'll see fruit. Yeah. You know, you say that, that you're not that extrovert. Well, I am the extrovert that, you know, I bowl people over when I'm half asleep. Mm -hmm. That's just as ineffective. Like, I'm terrible at it, too, <laughs> for all the opposite reasons. You know, I, I think of this lady named Flavia, who I know and love so dearly, who did Alpha years ago. And I'm not kidding. This sounds like I'm exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. She brought 100 people to Alpha wow. within a year. She never talked about within Jesus. Within a year. Within a year. Wow. She never talked about Jesus once in her entire life, never volunteered an hour of her time in her entire life and been Catholic her whole life until she did Alpha. God bless her. And she, and she is not an, it, oh, I don't know if she's an introvert or an extrovert or not, but she's very meek very quiet. Mm -hmm. But if she looks you in the eye, good luck. <laughs> good, good luck breaking that stare. She looks right into your soul. And when she asks you something to do something, it's because she cares about you and you can tell. And she has brought so many people to faith, way more than I ever had. I was the director of evangelization. I think I probably brought two people in 10 years. Uh, she brought a hundred in a year. Isn't that so like, that's such a beautiful truth. People today, more than ever, I think, especially with the advent of social media, yeah, they just want to connect with people who care. Mm. And she does. And we could also be led astray by people who care about things that aren't worth caring about. True. That's how you get somebody like Andrew Tate. I don't know, do you know Andrew Tate? No. Okay, so Andrew, Mike knows Andrew Tate. I heard him giggle in the background. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike doesn't giggle. <laughs> Smirked. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you get somebody like Andrew Tate who, so uh, little background for, for let's just say for you, maybe sure. the audience, yeah, yeah. popular TikToker, okay. um, been all over my, my social media feeds as of late. But what he does is he's got this message of like hyper masculinity and, and uh, he's kind of very conservative undertones, very traditional yep. undertones to his message in a world where like the sacred is being broken down all around us, tradition sure. is being broken down. All around, there's nothing objective anymore. Mm. Everything's just in the winds. Um, he's, he's bringing back that, that kind of message of like, there is objective standards, like men right. be strong, mm. provide, you know, and it's, it's a massive, a huge following. 
Yes. Super successful. Like Jordan Peterson says Jordan a lot Peterson, of the same things to men. Which I would recommend Jordan Peterson to your listeners <laughs> over jo- at Andrew Tate. <laughs> okay. But you got to, who, I forget who says it, was it Fulton Sheen? You got to have the, the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. So you got to know what's trending. You got to know what's moving people. And this guy's moving a lot of people. So, but where he misses the mark is people are following him because he's got this like traditional tone to his message. Mm-hmm. Because again, there's things that are good, true, and beautiful that transcend. Yes. And people are attracted to that. So he's got that. But then he misses the mark completely. He'll say something I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. Oh my God, what did he just <laughs> like? He just blows it out of the water. <laughs> and so, like, people like that are amassing a following. Yes. Because they're, they're hearing somebody who's speaking some truth, who's showing that he cares, but it's it's it just steers the wrong course. Yeah. And so it, how much more important for us is it that we care, that we speak the truth, and that we ultimately steer people onto the right course, which is Christ? Well, and, and when, when we talk about caring, Khalil, I think to myself, sometimes when I hear people, it can be like, you, you care more about your idea than you do about me. Like, you can care more about my, not you, but. Yeah, so you know, true. people, it's, yeah. you can care more about I do, my behavior. My ideas are great. You really <laughs> I do love your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> good to know. Yeah, good to know. Uh, you know, we can care more about people's behavior. We can care more yeah. about our numbers. We can care more about things. And and my experience too is, I've met very few people in the church like that. Just for the record, that can be the perception from the outside. When you get inside, when you meet people in the church, my experience is 99% of them you know are the most goes, unbelievable Rob, people ever. That where I see that more often than not, mm-hmm. and again, it's not a ton of people, but more often than not, it's like they want to engage somebody knowing that I want to take you to this destination. Right. Like they, they already have your end in mind, which is it's okay, but not really because I get you really of that. you engage people because I just want to get to know you. Mm-hmm. You know, what's up, Matt? What's up, Susie? Like, how are you? How are things? How are the kids? How's life? Hey, how'd that interview go? De- like, invest and care in the person and through who you are, the way you live your life and the 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 word the message that you speak, eventually that's again that encounter with the way, the leading of the yeah. into the life and the truth comes. But people know when, like, you've got an agenda or mm-hmm. when you p- push too early, like the Simon Sinek thing, why don't you give your life to Jesus Christ? Well, why don't you come with us to church on Sunday? This guy isn't ready to go to church on Sunday. He, the last time he was probably in church, if he ever was in church, was when he received his sacraments. And then he was like, all right, I'll see you guys later. Yeah. Most people, they drive by church. Like, that's the closest thing that they come to it. So, but if you lead with the relationship first, not the destination, it can be so much more fruitful and fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, my, my buddy who doesn't speak church says to me sometimes, Ron, you have to drop the agenda. And it's like, do I have an agenda? It's like, I want to, like, I'm an evangelist at heart, which means I want to bring people home to, to God. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, and so he, he, he brings attention into my life, a healthy one. And, you know, I was at a party the other day over Christmas. This is kind of a funny story. And I was with, um, Nicole, and it it wasn't what we thought it was, to say the very least. Uh, there was a lot of drugs and absolute drunkenness, and we're talking legit drugs, or yeah, no, no, yeah, these people were stepping outside to to do drugs and then coming oh, well, back okay. in cursing and swearing. I didn't Mind get you, to invite, but every was... one of them fallen away Catholics, <laughs> by the by the way, every one of them baptized and yeah, sacramentalized, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm entering into some conversations that are just ludicrous. And it's yeah. so funny because I unpacked it with Nicole after it was over. And she's like, because I was totally engrossed in the conversation and asking them questions and listening. Because I could see these people are lost and hurting. And yeah, yeah. They're, they have good intentions, but they're just so messed up. It's not funny. I don't even know where to go with this other than just listen to them, ask good questions, try not to be... You know, the F-bombs and the heresies and all the stuff that were there saying, just kind of letting all that roll off me. It's like, hey, they're them. Mm -hmm. I'm here. (laughs) Didn't mean to come. Didn't know that this is what I was coming into, but I'm here. And then sure enough. In God's providence, you were probably meant to be there. 
Well, and in parts of the conversation, all of a sudden, because I wasn't doing any preaching and, and any whatever, but just asking questions and they're bringing stuff up because they know who I am. And next thing you know, it's like, yeah, I was thinking about going back to church. And, and, and so then I'm able to talk to them about the priest because I know the area. And it's like, oh, you know, what kinds of things do you look for if you were yeah. to go to back to church? I like this. I don't like this. Oh, you're going to love this priest. Here's why. And, and then I'm able to talk about Alpha. And, yeah. you know, you might, you know. And so I was, even in the midst of insanity, because it was, it was mayhem. Yeah. By not being put off by the craziness, and it was crazy, and not having an agenda— Lo and behold, because they knew who I was, there was a, an opportunity to, even if it was only brief, to connect a little bit, to encourage what they were already thinking or what they were feeling guilty for, or what have you, because again, they're all baptized and sacramentalized. And, and then to be able to leave that place going, don't know if I'll ever do that again. In fact, I know I won't ever do that again. But I was able to be Because you don't present. want to place yourself in... Toxic situations. Oh, just exhausting. That's not what you're called to do. <laughs> that was exhausting. But you're called to be present yes. to wherever you find yourself. Yeah. And, you know, I joked, that reality, that mayhem is becoming the norm. That chaos mm. is becoming so common, especially as more drugs become legalized. Mm -hmm. It becomes more accessible to people. The usage goes up. Welcome to Canada. We're going to have to have a conversation about how do we remain present mm -hmm. to others mm -hmm. when it is such a regularly occurring thing now mm -hmm. and it's only going to get worse? Yeah. Um, so we shouldn't shy away from it. It's like, again, Jesus goes in knowing that he is the light and he brings the light. We should be able to go in any situation, yes. be confident in our identity, which is found in Christ, mm -hmm. and to bring that to others. Not preachy. But just to get to know people, most of the time people are just using, whether it's weed or mm -hmm. mushrooms or alcohol or whatever it is, as an escape from anxiety, pain. stress, pain, there's a better way. Mm -hmm. But I'm only going to get you to soften your heart and open your eyes if you see that I care about you. Mm -hmm. And if you see that I'm a person of integrity. Not somebody who judges you, not somebody who runs away from you, mm -hmm. but somebody who actually wants to invest in you. That's how you help in those types of situations. Amen. Again, not that I'm placing myself in them, but I'm present and I don't shy away from them. Right. Out of fear of anything as if, you know, I become unclean. Right. Just because, yeah. Or I'm going to be like them because I'm around them. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Khalil, I, were you going to say something? Oh, dude, I can go all day. So you just cut me <laughs> oh, off. Oh, we're going to do this on. again. <laughs> I'm going to give you a bunch of shorts. The, you probably won't even air this whole thing, but like, just post them. <laughs> David's going to have a field day with yeah. those shorts. The I got to tell you. So yep. I had this story with um, a salesman. Uh, so I was helping our pastor buy a car, yes. which that was a fun experience. <laughs> I heard a little bit about it this morning. but Did you? Going. Yeah. So, but the really cool thing is... Um, <laughs> The I went in with him once to the dealership, and then I'm calling, hey, father, father, you know, I, I never refer to him. I mean, he's father. It's, so I, I don't, I'm not sitting there calling him, hey, Sammy, what's up? Right. So it's like, hey, father, do you like this? Father, do you like that? Father, what do you think of this? And so the salesman, young guy, probably in his 30s, you know, he's hearing all that. And whatever, we, we leave. I come back a couple of days later just to continue the conversation. He goes, so that was really cool. You're, you're helping your dad buy a car. And he's like, I, I heard you calling him father. And, and I just, I started laughing because, you know, first of all, what a formal relationship. <laughs> you know, I'm not, like, not dad. Father. Yeah, not, not dad or pops or like, <laughs> father, what do you think? Like, how, you know, what kind of relationship is that? But that was an opportunity for us to have a conversation. Right. Very brief. No, actually he's uh He's, he's my pastor and uh, I'm helping him, you know, the cars for him. And, oh, that's really cool. So where are you guys at? Oh, we're at St. John the Evangelist in St. Right. John. Oh, I haven't been there, but you know, I'm aware of it. And so whether it's the chosen, whether it's alpha, whether it's whatever, mm -hmm. like our little nuggets that we can drop that lead people to Christ, whether it's mm -hmm. whatever it is, they can be a springboard to a conversation that shows like this guy 
you can be relatively normal yeah. and religious, right? Yeah. You can be relatively, and I say relatively because I'm talking about myself, normal, <laughs> and, you know, go to church and work for a church and have a great, great family and great friends. Yeah. And then afterwards, we, I started talking to them about TV shows and, you know, what are you watching? And yeah. like just the conversation grew into something more than just, hey, I'm here for the car. Right. Um, so just to be present in those moments mm. is so powerful. Love it. Well, thank you for your presence Thanks, on the show Ron. today. I love having you. It's always fun. <laughs> and Rock, if you want to reach out to us, right? Yeah. Make sure we plug the Connect at ronhuntley.com. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have your people call my people. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thank you very much. And thanks. I'd be interested to hear from you in terms of, as you listen to this conversation about evangelization, what's jumped out for you? What have uh, you struggled with? Wh where do you want to push back? Or what's working for you? I would love to hear because I'm not that great at it. And yet I know that I have a call on my life to help bring hope and good news to people who aren't living their best life, aren't connect it with Christ in a way that they can articulate. And I just believe that Jesus makes such a difference. He's made such a difference in my life. I, I can really relate to the, the statement that says, I'm not the man I should be. I'm not the man I ought to be. I'm not even the man I want to be, but I'm better than the man I used to be because Jesus is in my life now. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, hit the thumbs up, share, leave a comment. Uh, thanks for following and thanks for entering into this conversation. God bless you. I want to encourage you, as you lead this week, be faithful to God and generous to others. See you next time, and remember, if you're still breathing, you are powered for impact.